7th of June 2005, in the town of Yangcheonggu in Shincheongdong, Seoul, a woman in her 20s is found dead on the side of the road where garbage is usually kept, wrapped in rice bags. Six months later, in the same neighborhood, a woman is found next to a restaurant, also bound and wrapped up. Six months later, in the same neighborhood, a woman escapes a kidnapping. Hello everyone, welcome to Kimchi Crime Unsalted. The narration of unsolved crimes. Get it? Unsalted? Unsolved? Kimchi? Anyway, moving on. I'm W, otherwise known as Walter. And yes, these are Beats by Dre, 2011. And yes, they're falling apart. However, that's not why we're here today. In this series, we'll be taking a look at Korea's unsolved crimes. This differs from our podcast where SJ and I talk about serial killers or basically any kind of killer. In this series, I work alone to try and find some evidence for these unsolved crimes. And today we're starting off with a very interesting crime. And just to let you know, I did study criminology but I may have gotten something around the lines of a C in profiling. So, yeah, just... So, when we say unsolved, that's right. That means this person could be walking around at the moment. If you're living in Korea, maybe they live next to you. Maybe you've walked past them. Maybe you work with them. Maybe it's you. No, I'm kidding. Just, you know, if it's you, don't try and find me, please. Anyway, let's get started with today's case. 6th of June, 2005, in the town of Yangcheonggu in Shincheongdong, Seoul, a young woman in her 20s, whose surname is Kwon, is going to the doctors for a cold she caught. The doctor's office will be her last known whereabouts. On the 7th of June at 9am, Mr. Huang, a man whose job is to pick up the local trash in the area of Xinjiangdong, was doing his usual rounds. He pulls outside a building and notices two large rice sacks covering the top and bottom of something. As Mr. Huang goes to pick up the two rice sacks bound together, he notices that a hand was sticking out of one of the sacks. At first, Mr. Huang thought it was nothing and assumed it could be a mannequin that was thrown away. So, not thinking anything other than that, he tries to pick up the sacks. However, was surprised to feel the weight of what was in the sacks, then thinking to himself, something just wasn't right. Mr. Huang then goes in for a closer inspection and figures out it isn't a mannequin at all, but in fact, the body of a woman. To be more specific, Ms. Kwan the young lady who was just at the doctor's the day before her discovery. Immediately, Mr. Huang contacted police. Later, an autopsy of Ms. Kwan found that she was asphyxiated to death. Along with being tied up, she had a black plastic bag tied over her head. Ms. Kwan was also found with bite marks on her chest area, lacerations around her wrist, bruises on her neck. She was found with her legs bent, close to a fetal position. And, most peculiar of all, two menstrual pads and tissues were found inside her body. Most would assume inserting the pads and tissues were to absorb any possible traces of DNA. Hmm, but the coroner's report here found no traces of DNA or on or inside Mrs. Ms. Kwan's body and why would the killer forget to take them out? Were they almost caught? Were they in a panic? Either way, with no evidence and no eyewitnesses, this case came to a standstill. A restaurant owner, also in the area of Xinjiangdong, goes outside and notices an odd-looking mound of garbage. Looking very unusual, the restaurant owner gives it a kick to see what it could be. To his surprise, it didn't feel like any normal mound of trash. In fact, in his words, it felt squishy. So you don't need me to tell you that it was another body. 
This time, the body was covered in a picnic mat and layers of plastic bags bound with rope. The body was identified as a woman by the surname E. Miss E was found with a black plastic bag over her head and also was found with her legs bent and also signs of being physically beaten including bruises on her back. Miss E's autopsy report found that she was choked to death. Two women. Both deaths were from asphyxiation. Both were tied up and left outside in the garbage heap. Both women had plastic bags over their heads. Do we have a serial killer on the loose? On May the 31st, 2006, a woman by the surname Park is on her way to Mokdong Station to meet her boyfriend. But due to a taxi error, the woman misses her station and instead gets off at Xinchong Station, no more than a kilometre from her original stop. But this unfortunate one kilometre difference would lead to a terrible event in this woman's life. She was approached by a male who said to her, I will kill you if you scream. Reports say that she did scream, but the male perpetrator said that she had been drinking in the day and that she was drunk. No one stopped and asked if she needed help. So it isn't reported how, but she ended up in what is presumed as the male's residence and her eyes were covered before she arrived. Now here is where the case gets even more interesting. While she was in the apartment, Miss Park said she heard not one, but two voices. While one of the male perpetrators was in the bathroom, Miss Park managed to make an escape from the apartment. Instead of running outside, she ran to the second floor and hid behind a shoe cabinet. On the cabinet, she saw a sticker of the Mashimaro or Yopki Toki, a cartoon character that resembles a fat rabbit. After her escape from the apartment, the two men came out of the apartment swearing at each other. Miss Park waited for hours and she managed to make a run for it and survive the traumatic incident. Reports of the kidnapping had taken place in the same neighborhood that Miss Kwon and Miss E's bodies were found. Now, there are some gaps in the stories that I found of how she got to the perpetrator's house. If we run this through our head, the male would have had to lead the victim back to his vehicle, blindfolded her in the vehicle, maybe, and took her to his residence, or the perpetrator lives close enough to Xinchong Station to walk her there. We will get into that a little later. As I mentioned earlier, two of the victims were killed and disposed of in a similar way. On the show Korean TV program Kugoshi Algo Shipta, they make the assumption that because of Miss Kwon's hand was left hanging outside the bag, then the perpetrator must have been in a hurry and left the hand sticking out. The show then goes on to say that the perpetrator learned from his mistakes and therefore tied Miss Lee up even more. This was assumed because Miss Lee was tied up with more rope and knots. My argument is, why dump the body in such an obvious place? There could be also the possibility that the hand was deliberately left out. Serial killers are known most of the time, but not always, to have a premeditated plan uh, of where they'll dump the bodies and I would imagine dumping them in a place out of sight, right? In the small streets of Seoul, it is more common for small trucks to pick up the rubbish with men throwing the rubbish in the back, rather than your typical rubbish truck. Surely, you would know this if you have lived in South Korea long enough, no? Or are we dealing with a killer, or killers, that are of low intelligence? But in many cases, it isn't unusual for a criminal to commit crimes with areas that they are most familiar with, usually close to their home. You'll also have some serial killers who go back to the place where they killed or dumped the body to relive that moment, kind of the feeling of marking your own territory. Many serial killers are known to be narcissists. An assumption could be made with this particular killer is 
they dispose of the bodies in a way which they could be found easily, giving off the try and catch me vibe. Serial killers usually leave behind a signature, in this case it appears to be the plastic bag in the way the two bodies were positioned and wrapped. Another thing to take into account is the knot used on the women. According to reports, it was a professional style knot. What I think they mean is that not everybody knows how to do this knot. Let's hold on to that and quickly take into consideration the current society in South Korea and say that most South Koreans look for white collar jobs and often look down on blue collar jobs. Well, especially in 2005. We can assume that it is possible that this perpetrator works in a blue collar job since knowing how to tie knots. But I mean, that's a big assumption. But as I mentioned earlier, Criminals m commit many crimes in the area close to where they live. Now, Xinjiang-dong is located on the southwest side of Seoul and is relatively an undeveloped area. This is compared to other parts of the capital city. I wouldn't say a poor area, just less developed, therefore making it a cheaper area compared to other places in Seoul. Actually, in the same area of Xinjiang-dong is a neighborhood called Dedim, which had a notorious reputation for crime and gangs. It is also known that the male lived in a panjia or semi-basement. Living in these semi-basement residents are very cheap. You may have seen an example of this in the Oscar award-winning Korean movie, Parasite. So, it does give us a possible connection with the type of income he might be on. Now, another similarity between the cases is at some point not too long before they, the three were missing, they visited Xinchong Station. Ms. Lee was last seen on CCTV camera in Xinchong Station, placing them in the same neighborhood. Another thing to consider is Ms. Kwon was killed on a Monday, but it was a public holiday. Ms. Lee was killed on a Sunday. Ms. Park was kidnapped on a Wednesday public holiday. We can assume that the perpetrator works a Monday to Friday job, a job that keeps them busy throughout the day and that gives them time off on public holidays. Korea is known to have most stores and restaurants open 365 days of the year. So going off what I know about Korea, only office jobs and a few other blue collar jobs like postal workers, factories, etc. take these days off. Could I be wrong? Could this be an office worker? Anyway, there was some evidence left on Miss E's body in the form of mold, which did not coincide with any material of the clothing that she was wearing on the night. But it was confirmed to be mold from a building. And if you know anything about semi-basement apartments in Korea, they are usually great places for mold to grow which ties into the statement of the third case. Okay, so now let's look at the third case that has some leads. She escaped, so she remembered the place, right? Well, due to the fear and anxiety, she didn't remember where she was. She did run to a school, which she later reported to the police, but couldn't give clear detail as to which road she was running from, and that she only could see the front gate of the school. What she does recall is the violence that she received. She was repeatedly punched in the throat, maybe as a way to silence the victim. She also heard two males, one of them with a deep voice. The main perpetrator had eyebrows that looked like they were tattooed on, but weren't tattooed. One of the males was 175 to 176 centimeters and not a fat build, but more of the side of buff or stocky. Miss Park said he was in his mid to late 30s. Now, if Miss Park's observation was correct, we could assume that one of the perpetrators either goes to the gym or works in a job that requires heavy lifting. After she ran from the apartment, she hid in an elementary school ground that reportedly wasn't too far from the apartment. Korean investigators really concentrated on her description of the old shoe cabinet that she was hiding behind. 
Along with the sticker, Ms. Park said that it was old and had paint coming off it. There was also a flower pot on the top of the cabinet. A flower pot that was made at a kindergarten. Not a store-bought flower pot. Given that she spent hours waiting for her escape, this was the only thing that she focused on. Now, before we wrap up the evidence gathered, there was one more important lead. An anonymous caller called into the hotline open for anyone who had information on this case. They spoke of the Mashimaro sticker and said that her child thought it would be fun to stick it on the shoe cabinet. The caller also made it clear that their child made a flower pot and stuck it on the top of their shoe cabinet. It appears by reports that she owned the building and rented the semi-basement apartment to a man in his late 30s, but the man moved out before October 2006. They also stated that the person living in the rented apartment was sometimes alone and sometimes with another man, and that he had a job in Gurodong. Gurodong has a lot of workshops and factories. So let's break down what we have. We know the location. We know where the man used to live. We know the style of apartment he lived in and also the area that he lived in. A semi-basement apartment in a less developed neighborhood leading to a probable low income. A phone call reporting that he worked in Guro, a district known to have a lot of workshops and factories. Bodies were tied up in a professional way, a skill possibly linked to his job. The perpetrator could possibly be working a Monday to Friday job as all these crimes were committed on holidays and a weekend. We have one eyewitness and that is Ms. Park. She described him as a native Korean male in his 30s, roughly 175 centimeters, which actually doesn't help because the average height for a man in his 30s in Korea during that period was probably around 175 so, but at least we have a height. He had a stocky build. I guess now we have to consider that this male is in his late 40s, possibly early 50s. With no other evidence, I could not have come up with a more generic man if I tried in Korea. So, yeah. This is still unsalted. However, what do you think we missed out on? Is there things that we could follow up on? I believe that there is a possibility that you could go back and find those records of the people who were living in that apartment. But given that it was 2005, maybe things are a little bit more loose then. Why have they not reported about the contract signed by the man for the apartment that they were living in? That's interesting. Anyway, what do you think? Let us know in the comment section, like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Kimchi Crime Unsalted. Oh yeah, and keep an eye out for the podcast as well. We're gonna end it.